we look at expectations for the Baltimore Ravens 2022 season with a very special guest coming up next here on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire. We are here, of course, on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much for tuning in today, making Locked on Ravens your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms that includes over on YouTube. And today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by prize picks prize picks is daily fantasy made easy pick two to five players and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection you come up to 10 times your money on your entry first time users are going to receive 100 instant deposit match up to 100 with promo code locked on that's prizepicks.com promo code locked on we are back here it is tuesday a taco tuesday with a guest here we spoke to just a couple days ago i'm here to get his insight again i'm excited to do it for a ball to ravens wide receiver super bowl champion Kadri Ismail Q. Long time no see. We, we have plenty to dive into. We have some positive news. The Ravens getting that news on Monday with a very important player returning to practice. I tell you what, uh, this is crazy. I am look, you know, going over my my notes for the game and, and it's in the preliminary stages. And I'm hearing the Jets talk about whether or not they're going to have Wilson, whether or not they're going to have Flacco. But the cool news is the fact that the Ravens have Ronnie Stanley. And that's something that I think is a uh, Really, something that we can, uh, you know, sink our teeth into. If you're a Ravens fan, you you got to be super excited to hear that name, uh, looking like he was out there on the practice field and and participating. Yeah, it, it is really incredible news. I know Q. We have been very vocal about just how important Ronnie Stanley is to this team, to this offensive line, and for the offense, it does all start up front. And Ronnie Stanley being not only the best offensive lineman on the Ravens, but one of the best offensive linemen in this league when fully healthy, just to see him on the practice field. You know, the Ravens sharing some clips of him, the media obviously as well. I mean, j- just to see him back on the practice field, you going through some individual drills. I mean, h- how did it look to you? I thought he looked good. Um, clearly, again, they're, they're not uh, giving us full access to practice and you have the limited media view. So I'm not going to sit there and, and pontificate on all the things, but what I did saw um, was the fact that he he was able to move and it didn't notice or he didn't seem to have a noticeable limp or anything that was restrictive. Um, you know, he's going over his footwork and, and making sure that he was sound and solid. So for what we want, obviously, is to see him out there in, in full go action. And uh, I think he's a veteran enough of a player where you know, the, the, the mindset of getting right, he knows what it takes for himself to get himself right. And, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I am as anxious as it is for any player on the Baltimore Ravens, including Lamar Jackson, if Ronnie Stanley's out there. If he's healthy, ready to go, my goodness. I mean, Marcus Peters, JK Dobbins, all those guys, you know, they're all flash and everything and, and they are sound key pieces. Don't get me wrong. Man, there is something to be said when you got your left tackle locked down and he's the caliber of talent of a Ronnie Stanley. It is so important for them. And you mentioned J.K. Dobbins. You mentioned Marcus Peters. Those are all guys that many have their eyes on just in terms of when they are going to return from the field. Again, all three of those guys activated from the PUP list. Between those three, just one game between them in 2021, and that was the opening game for Ronnie Stanley before he opted for that second surgery. And John Harbaugh was asked a bit after practice yesterday, Q, about kind of the plan for Ronnie Stanley and what it is. And, you know, it's kind of been the same stuff from him and kind of just in terms of how the players feel. But he said it just depends on really how he's doing and it's just how they're feeling. And if he feels strong, if he's moving and feels like he was successful and they see what they need to see, they can be out there for week one potentially. Now, obviously, it's not a guarantee or anything, but out of those three Q, you have J.K. Dobbins, Marcus Peters, Ronnie Stanley, based off of anything and anything you've seen and anything, you know, who do you think has the best shot to be out there week one between those three players? So, I mean, the fact that Ronnie Stanley came back out, he was pretty much you know, MIA, the entire training camp, you know, we, we know that from an in shape standpoint, he's there. Um, 
But I, I like Marcus Peters. I like the fact that he was out there. I like the fact that, he, you know, his his process, he felt like, you know, I'm not going to get out there until I know I'm ready. And the fact that he was out there tells me that he feels that he's ready. You know, this is a veteran guy, a guy who is tremendous talent, relies upon his his intuition and his quickness. And he wouldn't go out there if he didn't feel that he was capable of being the, the Marcus Peters that we've been accustomed to seeing. So with him, you know, just being patient and, and doing what he does, I'm I'm uh I am very optimistic that we're gonna be seeing Marcus Peters. Uh again, I'm I am cautiously optimistic that we will see Ronnie Stanley. And um, you know, JK, you know, it's not that I'm saying that JK can't be out there it's not that i'm saying he's you know not uh tough enough but i think um with running backs you know it, it's 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 you know getting hit through that thigh wrapping up and going down type of a feeling that concerns me and it, you know you you gotta just you gotta go through it you gotta take that that you know mental hit to say that you know what i'm okay and i can play and you know, do my usual stuff. Uh, many a guy has come back from it. I know that this team, they, they pride themselves on recovery and uh, some of the techniques to help with soft tissue injury. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, this is a scenario where, yeah, he can, he can come back and he'll be fine and uh, all the things. I, I hope it is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see, um, what what he looks like because we do know bully ball is about running the football and we do know he's an amazing talent at the position of running back yeah and you know we're, we're not really gonna know q when these guys come back until they're back on the field and we're seeing them there or the ravens give some sort of update but i agree i think out of the three it just feels and i, I don't know what it is but it, ju it just feels like marcus peters is the closest to being back now does he play in week one or not? I don't know for, for any of the three guys, but it, it looks to be at least an attainable goal. Now it's a matter of can it actually be a, re, a realistic goal for them come Sunday against the Jets in week one. But Q, I know we've talked a bit about this before, but now that we're actually we're in game week right now for the Jets is coming up here in less than a week, which is crazy in itself to think about. With Ronnie Stanley, if he's out there, I'd assume he's probably going to play the majority of the snaps because he's feeling good. And maybe the Ravens do some rotation with him in and out to make sure he's not just getting thrown into action, thrusting that 100%. But even in terms of J.K. Dobbins and Marcus Peters, how many snaps or what percentage of snaps would you anticipate those guys playing based off the depth that the Ravens have for those positions and just how you ease those guys back from those types of injuries? Yeah, well, if, if Ronnie Stanley plays, I mean, you know, he's probably going to be the guy that gets the majority of snaps. He'll, he'll probably go the in, entire game. I mean, clearly you're not going to put him out there with um, any – level of special teams, whether it be, you know, PAT or uh, field goal, um, might maybe, maybe field goal, but I, I wouldn't even want to chance those two um, and give him a chance to, to take a break and, and, you know, put a guy in there that, that can do a, a, a adequate job. So no special teams for him. Um, but I think with Marcus Peters, honestly, like situational, he can be very situational. And I, I, I could see like, for example, if if you go out there and you you know there is a, a run dominant look, then he doesn't need to be out there. If you know that uh, it's obvious pass downs, put him out there and see how he holds up and 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 see what that you know feeling is for him in the second quarter. If he feels like all right, I'm ready, I'm juiced, I'm ready to go. What is he feeling like in that third and, and obviously fourth quarter um, will be dictated on how he he went out there and and. and and, and kind of got his uh, his body warmed up and ready to play. Yeah, it, it is interesting. It's kind of going to be like a almost wait and see, but just go out there and feel it out mm -hmm. type situation where, you know, we're going to see just how comfortable these guys feel. Hopefully they feel all the way back, but sometimes that's not the case. It can be one play gets you in a certain mindset. Maybe it's, oh, hey, I'm all the way back, or it's, oh, maybe I need to do this a little. So either way it goes, I think if any of these guys play in week one, Baltimore – We'll probably take somewhat of a cautious approach, but also understand that they can't necessarily play it for, for lack of a better term, scared. Like they can't play it just completely scared with these guys because they're going to have to get out there eventually. They're going to have to play the snaps eventually. They want to get out there, but it's key for them not to rush anyone back and say, hey, all right, you're back. Let's throw you out there for every single snap and, you, and you're back. You, you don't want to necessarily do that, especially after no preseason action to maybe get warmed up and guys coming back for the first time in 
for these guys pretty much a year, over a year in terms of NFL action, the meaningful NFL action. But coming up in our second segment here of the show, we're going to be diving into expectations for the Baltimore Ravens on the offensive side of the ball, talking Lamar Jackson and more. So be sure to stay tuned. We still have a ton to talk about here on the show. But first, I do want to tell you a bit about prize picks. In fantasy, it really has been a part of my life for such a long time. And, and we have the Locked on Ravens Fantasy Leagues this year. I'm super excited about those. But for prize picks, it's super easy to use. You can have a ton of current entries that you can have. And how does it work? You pick two to five players, and if they will go score more or less in their prize picks projection, you can up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That includes the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, college basketball, and more entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. It's the safe and fast withdrawals that are also really, really great. They are currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. So download the Prize Picks app or go to PrizePicks.com and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match of up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. We're back here with our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allshaker still here with Kadri Ismael and Q. The offensive side of the ball for the Ravens, I think there are plenty of expectations going into it, especially because number eight is returning to the football field this year after missing the final few games of the year last year. He had Tyler Huntley fill in for him. And look, the offense, I think, sputtered towards the end of the season. I thought the defense played relatively well, considering what happened in the first part of the year. But the offense with Tyler Huntley, I think he kept them in games and credit to him for doing that. But it's just a different dynamic when Lamar Jackson's on the field and what he can bring to the table. Now, the first part of Lamar Jackson's year Q, phenomenal. I mean, he was in that MVP conversation, had that MVP game, the signature game against the Colts, where he led that team to an overtime win. But then you see the struggles. You start to see it against the Miami Dolphins. It kind of starts from there. He misses the Chicago game and then the injury at the end of the year. But this is a player that I think has worked hard in the offseason. We've seen the body transformation He's gotten some new weapons and some guys getting elevated to bigger roles. What do you see from Lamar Jackson this year and your expectations for him? So my expectations are out of this world for him because of the fact that, you know, just contract alone. I mean, we're talking historic deal. We're talking how it was for him and, and what they thought was going to be, um, I should say, they, him, his people, because his people are him. He doesn't have an agent. Um, but the historic contract, the, the, the fact that, you know, they feel like, um, you know, he's going to be the highest paid quarterback. Uh, if it's all guarantee and in that Deshaun uh, Watson stratosphere, what, why are you going to pay him? Because you feel like he can win you a championship. You feel like he's your, your guy and, 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 and his resume, you know, pass and his resume going forward. The future looks bright with number eight as the Ravens quarterback. Uh, so I, I think, you know, just everything expectation wise, um, you know, the potential for him to, to really blow it up and do well. I think it's, it's, it's Lamar or bust, uh, Super Bowl or bust for him. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, he's said since day one, yes. But at the same time, the bigger picture is, hey, we're here now. Now it's time to show up and let's see what he got. Yeah, and I think from a perspective in terms of just some things that he was able to do really well last year, we saw him grow in a lot of different areas. I think we're going to continue to see growth overall. I mean, he is such an electric playmaker, both with his arm and with his legs. And I think now you, you see some of these guys starting to come back. You have some confidence in Rashad Bateman. We'll talk about him in a few minutes. Mark Andrews, obviously, as well, who was the best tight end in the league in 2021. Plus, the fact that, again, we've seen him work so hard and we know how much he wants to win. We, we've seen that competitive fire from him. I think he's motivated based off of that. But the fact that I think Baltimore is a team here, I mean, it's all about feeding off your teammates in some of these circumstances, Q. And I think the whole team supports Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson supports his teammates. And that's another thing I think is super, super huge. But Q, the Ravens running game is one that I know was not necessarily spectacular in 2021 because you lose J.K. Dobbins, you lose Gus Edwards, you're bringing in veterans who, you know, if we're talking 2015, it's an all pro team. <laughs> but we're, we're talking 2021 last year with guys like Devonta Freeman and, and Le'Veon Bell and, even Latavius Murray. Now you have guys, again, we talked a bit about J.K. Dobbins, but Kenyon Drake coming in, Mike Davis is there, Justice Hill fully back, and eventually we're hoping Gus Edwards is back in that full. But it feels like the Ravens are shifting back to that bully ball, as you have talked about so many times here on the show, and I completely agree with you. 
but your expectations for this running game Q, how high are they? <laughs> we talk about expectations with Lamar. I mean, the the bully ball is about running the game, uh, running the ball, and and that's their game. I mean, they they don't. It's not that they don't want to pass the ball. They want to physically dominate you at the point of attack. Uh, this isn't, you know, where your average running game, where you're averaging, you know, 100, 110, maybe 120 a game. No, this is like, you know, clipping off 220 a game. This is big runs down the field. That's why last year, yes, it was a who's who's list of, of running backs, but those guys were all in the rearview mirror of their, their prime, you know, for for the running backs that you listed, they all bring a different skill set to the table, and I'm hoping Kenyon Drake can bring that explosiveness to the table and that elusiveness that we've seen from him. Uh, unlike you know last year's group of, of veteran guys that were brought in, um, Devontae Freeman you know was a great guy when it came to making these dynamic moves, but then he'd only get eight yards. Maybe eight yards on other teams was really good, but boy, you know this is bully ball and. You know, when they were in their prime and they were doing their thing and, and, and just dominating the league, it was what? It was like 200 and some odd plus a game. It was, you know, eight, nine, 10 yards averaging a clip. Uh, that sets everything up for Lamar Jackson. So the running game itself is paramount to the Ravens' success. That's why, yeah, maybe, you know, throwing a little caution to the win with J.K., I don't mind it. You know, I don't mind that he, you know, if they start him off slow. Why? Because we don't need you until we really need you, which is later in the year. Later in the year is when, you know, that that's that's when you need to be playing your best football. I want him to feel really good. I don't mind that Gus Edwards is not fully out there just yet. Uh, I'm curious to see, you know, how, again, like Kenyon Drake, what, what do we got with you, bro? Uh, do you got anything left? And if you do and if you're ready, let's show it off. Because I think it sets everything up because of the fact that you got number eight back there. Everybody's going to be on him. Every defensive coordinator, uh, every linebacker that's going to be calling out the defense. You know, those situational moments, it's all about where's Lamar Jackson. You get caught up in him and you got a good running back or running game. Phew, bruh, that's where the beauty of it all is. It is. And I think, Q, something that I expect them to do, well, I expect them to be better in this area, but first down runs. I think when you can get yourself, and we, we've seen it, you mentioned those eight, nine yard runs. If those are coming on first down instead of a second and 15 or a second and 12, it's so important to be able to get yourself, I think, as an offense into a second and short situation instead of a you know two yard carry on first and 10. You put yourself in second and long, that turns into third and long, and then you get you know, a, a long situation, either convert or you're going three and out. I think if the Ravens, and we've seen it, where guys go for eight yards on first down. We saw it with Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins and those guys, as you talked about, back in 2019 and 2020. Baltimore's offense, I think, could be so much more efficient if they can get into that rhythm again of getting six, seven, eight yards on first down. You can pick up the extra four, three, two yards easily, or even put yourself in a third and one, you try to guy like uh, like Davis out there or Kenyon Drake or whoever, you can play action off of that. There are so many things you can do as an offense in that way. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have high expectations for this Baltimore run game. I did a bull prediction show yesterday. I said they're going to be a top three rushing offense, even without – I mean, maybe a fully healthy J.K. Dobbins or the honor without Gus Edwards on the field for the first four games. So uh, very high expectations there. But, Q, the pass game also, I agree with you. I think Baltimore's going to go back to the bully ball, but that doesn't mean they're going to just neglect throwing the football altogether. I think we're going to see a more balanced effort from them than we saw in 2019. But I think it will shift more back towards the run game. But in the past game, Rashad Bateman is a, is a huge benefactor of the Marquise Brown trade, catapulting up for that number one receiver role. Super high expectations in Baltimore. Are yours also high for him? For Say that one more time to the last person. For, for Rashad Bateman. For Rashad Bateman, yeah. So here, here, here's the thing. As I'm going through this list, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the lineup of guys and – you really don't – there's such a, 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 a drop-off from Rashad Bateman and the, the next guy up. Um, it's just one of those things where if Bully Ball does its thing, Rashad Bateman is going to be in a lot of one-on-one -on -one coverage because I don't really need to cover anybody else from a receiver standpoint. And I think, you know, yeah, they bring in Robinson. Don't get me wrong. I, I think he'll be strong. I think – you know, there's some some really good things that he can do. But uh, Bateman, 
he has to be the guy one on one, eight guys in a box or safety help or nickel help is taken away. Mark Andrews and you're doubling down on, say, uh, likely. And we're just going to see if Lamar can throw it to his outside dude. Well, hallelujah. Yes, I believe he can. <laughs> I think it's going to be a good opportunity for Bateman to really just show that he's that guy. He's that dude. He's the one that can be a number one threat as a wide receiver. Now, not the number one threat on the team. Let's not get it twisted. That's Mark Andrews. But I think he can be a number one threat as far as a wide receiver and what they need from a go-to guy on the outside. Yeah, and you, you talk about Mark Andrews. I agree. He is definitely the number one target for Lamar Jackson has been now, you know, for, for a couple of seasons, the chemistry yeah. they've established those two has, has been incredible, but you look at a tight end room queue that has Isaiah likely just chopping at the bit to get more playing time, more snaps, and obviously get in there and, and make an impact early on. And I think when you talk about the way that Greg Roman has run this offense in the past, in terms of when everybody's healthy, you know, when you have all your personnel, we see it in their ability to work the play action game, but it's not just that with Isaiah Likely and even Mark Andrews. These guys are versatile. They can line up in line. They can line up in the slot. You could even put Isaiah Likely out wide if you really wanted to. I mean, how do you think the Ravens are going to line up these tight ends throughout the course of the season? Ooh, I'm just drooling just thinking about it. So the thing is, you, you know, you, you got your Nick Boyle, um, who I'm not saying that he's going to be uh, – Intracol is is key, but intracol in the way in which, you know, remember when they would shift, they would have, you know, him at fullback, and then they would split him out, and then they would just so <clears throat> so in other words, they would force linebackers and safeties to move depending upon um the formation and then depending upon either their shift or their motion. And so the reason why I say Nick Boyle is because I think when you do have a mismatch, like an Isaiah Likely, all the attention is going to be on Mark Andrews. And if you can get a guy like a Nick Boyle to, to shore up protection on one end and then have Isaiah do his thing, now you're putting this defense in a world of hurt because then you come back and then you have a Nick Boyle, Isaiah Likely, you have – um obviously Mark Andrews and you split out Mark or you split out uh, Isaiah and they're on the same side. Again, you're talking about Nick Boyle who is now in for protection again. So as much as you think, Oh yeah, we just go ahead and get to Lamar because you know, your tight ends are going to be in there for blocking. No, oh, no, no, no. You think you're going to do that. But then all of a sudden you're going to have guys going down the field with mismatches. And that's the critical element of it all. That 13 personnel, uh, when you get those three tight ends, mother of pearl. I, I, I'm just, I'm really super excited to see what it really is going to turn out um, like and and how defenses are going to have to, you know, uh, acclimate. Because again, if you say, if you do go uh, a big nickel and Lamar and company see that, well, you get an RPO, you know, that's going to be where, you know, you get your office alignment firing out. They're thinking it's a run. And then Lamar can go ahead and read a safety and see what it's like. But he has confidence to make that throw, not only to Mark Andrews, but he'll have, I think, Isaiah being able to be that, not necessarily big body like a Mark, but big body enough and at the same time finesse enough to break tackles and make big plays. Exciting group. The, the, the world is their oyster. And we haven't even talked about Kohler, who's nursing a hernia recovery surgery. They, they have so much depth. It is so incredible that, you know, you talk about Mark Andrews, who was the best head in the league last season. You pair him up with a guy like Isaiah Likely. You know what you're getting in a fully healthy Nick Boyle from a blocking. And I'll give him credit. He's improved as a receiver over the course of his career. He was pretty one-dimensional when he came out out of Delaware. But he's turned himself into, I think, a, at least a, a viable pass-catching option in Baltimore. But Q, the offensive line has, has been a very big storyline. We talked about Ronnie Stanley a little bit. They have made upgrades on that line, both starter-wise and depth-wise. You have Morgan Moses sliding in at right tackle. Tyler Linderbaum is that starting center. Kevin Zeitler should have been a pro bowler last year. And if Stanley can come back and is that Ronnie Stanley we know, I think this offensive line has the potential to take a massive leap in 2022. Yeah, I mean, I think the only kind of nervousness that I would have is, again, uh, you know, Tyler Linderbaum had the foot, but he seemed like he came back in final preseason game against the Commanders, looked strong. 
you know, they've been kind of chill with Morgan and, and obviously, you know, Kevin, I, I kind of almost forgot about him because, you know, our, our, you know, mindset was on whether or not, you know, Daniel, Ben and Ben, uh, well, obviously Tyree Phillips is, is kind of gone with the win, but there was a real true battle on that offensive line for the guard spot. And I think for Ben Powers to be able to be in that, you know, place and feel comfortable and confident. Um, Ronnie Stanley, as we talked about, uh, Tyler Linderbaum, who I think is just going to be a, a star in this league. Uh, yeah, last year uh, down to the final stretch, and you can say what you want without Lamar in there, but from a backup quarterback aspect of things, I thought Tyler Huntley looked amazing, and his play was deserving of at least more than just the Chicago victory, at least one more victory. Um, but a lot of it had to do with the offensive line play. I think this offensive line, you know, just looking at it, I love it. I think they they have an opportunity to uh, to do well. I think so too. I think based off what we saw at the end of last season, I think they have clear upgrades across many different positions of that line. You're bringing back a, a should have been pro bowler in Kevin Zeitler. So I think they, they have so much room to improve. My expectations for them, I mean, also super high overall. But coming up, we'll be diving into the defensive predictions and also expectations for this team in our final seven B. So be sure to stay tuned. We still have a ton to talk about here on the show. But first, I do want to tell you a bit about Built Bar. And if you haven't tried the Built Bar Puffs yet, you are really missing out. And guess what? There is a new flavor. It is delicious. And it is the indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again with the cookie dough chunk puffs. They have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks. And of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. They're only 160 calories. They have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them as well. And again, like all Built Bars, the new cookie dough chunk puffs are covered in 100% Real chocolate, that means they're healthy and they're tasty. And what's great about Built is other bars are made with proteins, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides a ton of health benefits as well. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15. Get 50% off your order, use promo code LOCK15. We're back here with our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allshaker still here with Kadri Ismael in Q on defense. Expectation-wise, I want to start on the defensive line because the Ravens, again, they have that balance of veteran and youth in terms of the talent pool they have. Clays Campbell, Michael Pierce, Brent Urban. You also have guys like Travis Jones, who status for, for week one, pretty up in the air right now, but you also have just met Abike and Roderick Washington there. One area I have high expectations for in particular, Q, is the interior pass rush. I think that Baltimore has... Struggled there pretty immensely over the course of the past couple of seasons, just generating interior pressure, especially when just rushing three or four guys. I think their personnel this year dictates that they might have a little more success there. Yeah, so from an inside pass rush, you, you are talking about, you know, Travis Jones, who they drafted. And, again, you know, we, we saw what happened, you know, in the preseason game. And, you know, he had his uh, own guy kind of fall on his leg and, uh, you know, has a little sprain that he's dealing with. And, and, and I don't say little because he's a big man and – I think Michael Pierce, it's great to see him back. I know Calais Campbell uh, is chomping at the bit to kind of, you know, reestablish, you know, not only himself as a, a dominant force, but you know, just his leadership and, and what he brings to the table. But, uh, yeah, Brent Urban and that that big, you know, long body of his knocking down balls and batting balls down. I don't care what quarterback is back there. Uh, that, that, that spells trouble for the life of a quarterback trying to throw the ball down the football field. No, absolutely. And I think Baltimore right, might have to rely a bit more on their interior pass rush with just what their guys on the outside linebacker group look like right now in terms of health at the time of this recording queue. The Ravens have two healthy guys, and that is Adafi Owe and Justin Houston. Now, my expectations for them, I, I think, are very high. And while my expectations for them are pretty high, you're looking at the rest of the group and you're thinking, well, there's not a rest of the group. <laughs> I, I, I think the sky is the limit for Adafi. Um, I like the fact that, you know, it, it's one thing, you know, as a player you learn and uh, your first year you'll, you'll know, have a veteran and you kind of see what they do. But it's another thing to start to own it for yourself. It's another thing to start to take in what you've, you've learned and, and really mold it for your game. And mentally I think he's locked in. I think, you know, some of the tricks of the trade that he, he kind of learned from Justin Houston, I think he's growing and evolving his game. So I think – that evolution of what we see, you know, the Joe Burrows of the world, obviously over in Pittsburgh is going to be kind of a, a, a toss up, but uh, you know, be that as it may, Mr. Bitsky so far, this is who we know. Um, when you, when you, you know, look over and, 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 and see in Cleveland, you know, I think part of Cleveland is 
okay, we know they're going to probably be dinking and dunking it down the football field just because they don't have their big gun in Deshaun Watson. But when he does come back, guys like Adafi Owe and Justin Houston, they're going to have to be licking their chops and saying, we're in midseason form. Here we go. We're about to do this thing against you, bro. That's 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 the big thing. That's your division. You take care of those quarterbacks in your division. Take care of the Joe Burrows in your division. You know, it might be only two. Who knows what Eric DaCosta is going to be doing. Like you said, you know, of, of this recording, here's what we have so far. But uh, I'm sure Eric DaCosta is going to be trying to figure it out very soon. Right. And I think when you're talking about big years, maybe not make or break, but I think big years, Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison are two guys that I think come to mind for me. Patrick Queen, I think, is less so of a make or break year than Malik Harrison. I think Queen, you know, has shown the flashes. And I mean, so has Harrison, but I think you just want more consistency with both guys. I think that's the key term for them. So now entering year three for both of those guys, where are you at with those expectations? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I do think it's a make or break year for Patrick Queen. I do think the pressure of where he was drafted and and, and the high expectations of <clears throat> being that middle linebacker, and we know middle linebacker you, uh, you know, it, it, it translates over into, you know, uh, the all-time best linebacker to ever lace him up is number 52 and got that you out front in Ray Lewis. And I think if Patrick Queen – uh, now that he's over at the weak side linebacker, moved him from, you know, middle linebacker spot, bringing in another veteran and Josh Bynes. I think for what Patrick Queen uh, needs to do is just, just he, he talks about the maturing process. He talks about the game slowing down. Okay, I, I mean, how slow do you need it? You know, like this is this is it. This is like, you know, we we want to see you and we want to see what you got. So uh, I'm 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 really anxious to see that. Well, Malik. Harrison, I think he's more a role uh, player, and 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 there's going to be times where, yeah, when you get in there, however many snaps, make them meaningful snaps. That's the bottom line for Malik Harrison. And I think talking about meaningful snaps, I think the secondary, they're going to play many, many meaningful snaps over the course of the 2022 season. Your cornerback-wise, we talked about Marcus Peters a bit in that first segment, Q. But, I mean, I'm super excited for the safety group as a whole with Kyle Hamilton, Chuck Clark, Marcus Williams. You have so much depth there. And I think the secondary Baltimore, look, they are a team that is heavily invested in that group over the course of many, many years now. I mean, with, with how much money they've invested, the draft capital, expectations have to be pretty high there for a lot of people, it feels like. Extremely high. And I think this is where, you know, if you're, you know, looking at the bigger picture, this could be the, the strength of the defense. Um you know, there's a saying, you know, if you got good coverage, your pass rushers are happy. And there's also the opposite, too. If you got good pass rushers, that means your corner is going to have opportunities to pick the ball off because, you know, the quarterback's going to be throwing it up there if he's running for his life. I think the fact that you got two savvy guys and Marcus Peters and Marlon Humphrey, I think Marlon is, is ready and he's, you know, said it many a time, even on his own podcast, the bounce back year the, the the aggressiveness of unfinished business the the ability um to create turnovers didn't really get a lot of turnovers last year you know the whole idea of what fruit punch brought to the table and um just didn't get it done last year i think you know it it, it stuck with him you know he talked about looking at some of the 2000 ravens defense and uh and, and the way in which you know, my guys played and, and played historically and how dominant they were. You know, I, I you know, Kyle Hamilton, I'm I'm excited for his chance to play, but I think we got a mad and ticked off Chuck Clark, and I think we have a talented Marcus Williams, who I think will be in that that mix, and then eventually we'll see, you know, Kyle Hamilton and, and seeing what he can do. But uh a lot, a lot of options for Mike McDonald, new defensive coordinator. And I think that's <laughs> read my mind. That's exactly where I was going next. You see the play callers here with this, both offense and defense key. You have Greg Roman there who has had multiple years to kind of shape this offense. Now enters 2022 here. Maybe if the Ravens don't get off to a hot start and the Ravens have that, you know, maybe they have to find a scapegoat. Maybe it is uh, Greg Roman, but in terms of Mike McDonald, a very young defensive coordinator coming in, a lot of high expectations for him. I mean, how do you expect the both the offense and the defense to be run by these two guys in 2022? 
coordinator wise, guy on a hot seat, guy who's been under fire, Greg Roman, hands down. If we do anything on social media, we mentioned Greg Roman, um, this guy, he, he's going to be getting it. If you look at their um, offense last year, uh, total offense, <laughs> from a statistic standpoint, they were ranked six total, total offense, 378 yards a pop. Obviously, the rush offense was third with 145. Think about it, Kevin. We're just so used to what Bully Ball brought. Like, we, we yawn at, you know, 145, and, and people would be dying to have 145. Um, you know, the, the points per game were down. Obviously, you know, just the whole idea of the red zone offense, uh, it, it, was, it was top 15. But we, again, were used to, as soon as you get into the red zone, score, period. End of discussion. Don't even worry about it, Justin. Uh, just, just go ahead and get your mind right for the extra point. So, again, I think, you know, from a ranking aspect of things, I, I, I you got a top six offense. What, what, what are we doing here? You know, I think uh, the pass offense, um, you know, middle of the pack. Top 15 offense, you know, is number 13 in the, in the league. Okay. Like, again, tons of injuries. So if there was a coordinator who, yeah, was under fire, but at the same time, I think he can, uh, you know, do his thing with a healthy Ronnie Stanley with a a motivated um, Lamar Jackson. I think he should be fine. I think, you know, defensively, that pass defense, which was ranked dead last and, and got Wink Martindale up out of here, I think that's where Mike McDonald is uh, going to be, you know, looking at some things. And, and we'll see whether or not, you know, he uh, he gets it done. I think he does. I really do. I really think that they love him. I think McDonald is – is young, but he's 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 uh, earned everyone's respect when it came to just what he wants from schematics of his defense. Yeah, and the thing I, lo- I love about Mike McDonald is the fact that he was in Baltimore for so long, then went off to Michigan and kind of did his own thing and established himself as a play car, then is now back in Baltimore. So I, th- I think both these guys, I mean, big years for both of them, obviously Mike McDonald establishing a tone as a first-year defensive coordinator for Greg Roman. I mean, this is a guy that has seen success at the NFL level. There are certainly aspects he has to improve on. Definitely. I've been, I've been pretty neutral in the whole Greg Roman thing. I think he's a good offensive coordinator, but there are areas he should improve in. So overall, I think that the Ravens, they are a team with high expectations after an eight and nine season. And I'm excited to see how they perform in 2022. Q, when we talk next week, We'll be talking about a team that either got the job done against the Jets or, or didn't, and we'll be previewing that Week 2 game against a very talented Miami Dolphins team. Yeah, I, we can look ahead, but the Ravens can't. So it's going to be exciting to see how uh, things will unfold. Yeah, it's going to it's gonna be an early stretch for them that's very important, but I think that – you know, if they can come out maybe at least two and two, hopefully like a three and one type deal. Hey, I think I think that's a pretty good start to the year overall. But thanks so much, Keith, for hopping on. I appreciate you. And that's all I have for you here today on Locked On Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. When we get back here tomorrow, we'll be diving into finalizing some stuff for what should be a very special show tomorrow. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And I'll see you right back here tomorrow.